situated between two great rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates, originating in the Armenian highlands and flowing all the way to the Arabian Gulf, Mesopotamia is a rich and fertile land. The name itself refers to its location, as Mesopotamia comes from two Greek words, mesos, meaning between, and potamos, meaning river. This area was teeming with cities and empires that date back to the very beginning of human civilization. Mesopotamia is a region that covers much of present-day Iraq and parts of Kuwait, Syria, and Turkey. It is widely believed that this region was the cradle of civilization and witnessed the rise and fall of the first cities built by mankind. Long before excavations began in Mesopotamia in the mid-19th century, the Bible mentions civilizations that existed in the Near East, including Babylon, Ur, and Nineveh, making the Sumerians contemporaries of the ancient Israelites. The location of these cities was relatively unknown to most Westerners, so much so that it began to seem like a place that existed only in myth. However, everything would change in the 1840s when two archaeologists, Sir Austin Henry Layard and Paul Emile Botha, rediscovered the legendary cities of the Old Testament. Before Layard and Botha, Europeans made a number of attempts to discover these sites. Some were successful, but others were not. Unlike most Europeans, who were unsure where ancient cities like Nineveh were located, it was common knowledge to the natives living in the region, so much so that they were said to be able to pinpoint the location of Jonah's tomb without a problem. However, the first major archaeological excavations to find these ancient cities did not begin until 1842, when the French archaeologist Paul Emile Botha and his group began digging near Mosul, then under the rule of the Ottoman Empire. Although their goal was to find Ninvi, they discovered the Great Place of Sargon. Just a few years later, another archaeologist from Britain arrived in Mosul to search for the cities mentioned in the Bible and made an amazing find. Not only did he manage to excavate the main part of Nineveh, but he also discovered the library of Ashurbanipal. A detailed video about the unique 3,000-year-old library of Ashurbanipal and its fearsome government can be found in the description below this video. Thanks to these discoveries, we have been able to learn much about the great civilizations and cities that rose and fell in Mesopotamia long, long ago. One of the most remarkable finds in Ashurbanipal's library is the Epic of Gilgamesh, the earliest literary work in history. These discoveries have given a whole new perspective on the way the people of the 18th century BC viewed the world. Not only have they helped us today to imagine what life was like in those bygone days, but they have also provided valuable insights into how civilization came to be. From this humble beginning in Mesopotamia, agriculture, animal husbandry, religious and political buildings, bureaucracy, complex social structures, codes, writing and art gradually developed and began to be present in numerous cities. The centuries-old search for the birthplace of civilization. While it is true that the major European powers are the originators of what is considered a modern archaeological effort and rediscovery of Mesopotamian civilizations, the United States has also played an important role in uncovering the past. In fact, in the decades of archaeological excavation in the Mesopotamian region following the Layard and Botha finds, the United States sent representatives to conduct excavations alongside European archaeologists. This took the form of researchers and archaeologists, in particular from the University of Pennsylvania and the Oriental Institute of the University of Chicago. From the beginning, the goal of American explorers has been to study the birth and development of civilization, or at least that was James Henry, Breestead's goal when he founded the Oriental Institute. He said he dreamed of creating a research institute that would become a laboratory for the origin and development of civilization. Breasted seems to have believed that Western civilization had its roots in Mesopotamia, and it was also he who popularized the term Fertile Crescent, which today is one of the most famous names for the region. 
However, the Fertile Crescent did not only include Mesopotamia, but also many of its surrounding areas, including Israel, Syria, Palestine, Jordan, and Lebanon, as well as parts of Turkey and Iran. This is the region where scientists believe settled agriculture developed after thousands of years of hunting and gathering by early human ancestors. The Sumerians are believed to be the first culture to have emerged in this region. We are obliged to note that the mysterious man-made site of Gobekli Tepe, which predates Sumerian civilization by thousands of years, is believed to have been inhabited in 9500 BC, but was abandoned in 8000 BC. In contrast, the Sumerians settled in Mesopotamia between 5500 to 3300 BC. Eridu is the earliest city on the list of kings at that time. According to some sources, however, Nineveh was first settled as early as 6000 BC. If you look at the region now, you might wonder how civilization developed in a seemingly hostile region with a semi-desert environment. At the northern and western ends of Mesopotamia was the vast Syrian desert. At the same time, to the east were the Zagros Mountains, which bordered the Iranian plateau on the other side. So how? Contrary to its appearance today, Mesopotamia was wetter, thanks in part to the swamps, reed beds, lagoons, and mudflats scattered throughout the region. The Tigris and Euphrates played a key role in maintaining rich and fertile soil. The Fertile Crescent is generally fed by the two rivers, in addition to the Nile. Because it lies at the center of the two rivers, Mesopotamia is subject to regular flooding, a phenomenon that, while troubling and dangerous, makes it a fertile land where the population grows grains and fruits for food and gathers reeds to build their homes. Fishing and clay production were also convenient due to the region's proximity to large bodies of water, including the Arabian Gulf to the south. However, this was not always the case. According to University of Chicago professor and Assyriologist Hervé Reclou, northern Mesopotamia received more water than its southern counterpart. It is generally accepted that Mesopotamia as a whole was divided into two parts, upper and lower. Around 4000 BC, the climate became drier as swamps receded from the south, and the inhabitants there had to find other ways to survive without relying entirely on the elements, such as rain. In order to adapt to the ever-changing environment and climate, the people of Lower Mesopotamia had to make some changes to their way of life. Irrigation developed as a method, with water being obtained from nearby water bodies. Thus, even if rain was sometimes scarce, they could easily rely on small-scale irrigation to water their crops. Ironically, this paved the way for a significant leap in human civilization. As the demands of climate change increased, so did the workload and the need for organization. Tasks that required coordination, such as building irrigation canals, may have helped them apply this knowledge to other projects. Eventually, structures such as roads and buildings with political or religious significance were erected, and along with this, a social hierarchy emerged, with those who controlled the most land, resources, and people at the top. The lower class people accepted to work, and allowed themselves to be subordinated in exchange for pay. As opposed to others who were forced to work, the rulers of a city were often called Ensi. At the same time, the word Lugal was reserved for those who controlled more than one territory or the whole of Sumer. As a result of this tremendous development, the first Mesopotamian cities appeared, called the Urban Revolution, by visiting assistant professor of history Kellyanne Diamond at Villanova University, it marked the rapid progress of human society toward a developed one. Innovation and invention flourished throughout Mesopotamia with Sumerians applying knowledge from other ancient cultures and using it to improve their own livelihoods. Uruk was one of the earliest cities in Mesopotamia, thought to have been home to 50,000 inhabitants at its peak. That may not sound like much compared to our idea of a large city today. However, about 5,000 years ago, 
Uruk was like the New York or even Tokyo of its time, if we base it on population density alone compared to small towns and villages during the same period. It was also a walled city, which is a testament to how important and powerful it was in its heyday. Uruk was not the only city that flourished during the time of Sumer. Nippur was also an important city, largely because it was the special place of worship for Enlil, one of the three major gods of Sumerian religion. Excavated briefly by Laird, most of the research has been carried out by scholars and researchers from the University of Pennsylvania, led by Americans John Punnett Peters and John Henry Haynes, as well as German Hermann Vorath Hilprecht. Peters would later join the study of Tel Yoka, where Uma, another ancient Sumerian city, was once located. In addition to Peters, other scholars at the University of Pennsylvania have been involved in many, many other studies in the ensuing decades. The institution also coordinated with the British Museum during the 1922 to 1934 survey of another significant Mesopotamian site, this time the city of Ur. During the excavations, many significant finds were discovered, including the royal tombs. There is also speculation that Ur is actually the biblical city of ur Kasdim, the birthplace of Abraham. Shortly thereafter, the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago came on the scene, making the presence of Americans at archaeological sites in Mesopotamia more permanent in the years that followed. The archaeological efforts of the last 150 years. Almost continuous wars, starting from the Crimean War all the way to the two world wars, as well as the recent large-scale and devastating conflicts in the region, have brought archaeological activities to a halt from time to time. American interest in Mesopotamian archaeology persisted before and after World War II. The 1920s and 1930s saw an expansion of excavation efforts throughout the region. In those times, foreign archaeologists took most of the important artifacts found in the excavations. Bell, realizing how important these artifacts were to the country from which they came, fought to create a system whereby at least a large portion of the artifacts would be kept in their own museum. English archaeologist Gertrude Bell lobbied for the creation of the Baghdad Archaeological Museum, later renamed the Iraq Museum, to help preserve Iraqi culture and history. Now, in coordination with the Baghdad Archaeological Museum, Europeans and Americans are continuing excavations at existing sites and beginning those at others. For several decades after World War II, excavation and research at Mesopotamian sites continued. Led by American archaeologists, the goal this time was to trace the evolution of humanity from hunter-gatherers to settlers to urban dwellers. If the primary goal of the first archaeologists in this area was to find evidence of long-extinct cities in the region, this time they want to study prehistoric Mesopotamia and what it took to get it to the point where it became the world's earliest known civilization. The search, which began with the goal of finding biblical evidence and artifacts to place in museums, eventually became a journey to discover the beginnings of humanity as a civilized species. It was a pivotal moment in the history of mankind. In fact, it is quite a noble quest for those who have devoted their lives to it. From the American scientists searching for the very beginnings of Western civilization, to the Iraqi archaeologists who want to reconnect with their roots and protect their heritage. Unfortunately, this search will be buried by war, bloodshed, and controversy. The museum was forced to close its doors at the start of the Gulf War in 1991. Due to the sanctions imposed on Iraq, archaeological research in the former region of Mesopotamia has been severely affected. Because of the restrictions, maintenance and protection of the site also became severely limited. However, this gives looters the chance to take important artifacts and sell them on the black market. But the worst is yet to come. During the invasion of Iraq by the U.S. and its allies, many sites were bombed. While the museum was largely left alone, albeit seriously unprotected, some archaeological sites were bombed by U.S. forces. Then, on April 9, 2003, 
museum staff and curators were forced to evacuate as the conflict deepened. The following days witnessed one of the most widely publicized and criticized lootings of all time. Thousands of artifacts were looted during the chaos, many of which were sold on the black market. Some were fortunately recovered, while others have not been found to this day. The United States has received flack for not doing enough to protect the Iraq Museum during its occupation of Baghdad. In the years that followed, the US and other governments, such as Italy, made efforts to recover the looted items and return them to Iraq. In the months and years that followed, the United States was one of the major powers making efforts to recover lost manuscripts and artifacts. U.S. Marine Colonel and Manhattan Assistant District Attorney Matthew Bogdanos has led the search since 2003. By 2006, 10,000 artifacts had been found thanks to his efforts alone. The Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago initiated the dissemination of information about the stolen artifacts on its web page. However, we see that this page has not been updated for quite some time. Iraq itself has done its best to recover the lost artifacts. From the director of the Iraq Museum, Dr. Donnie Juhana, to individuals and groups such as the one led by Iraqi sculptor Mohammed Ghani Hikmat. Many Iraqis have made tremendous efforts to recover the missing objects. However, the extent of looting of artifacts from museums and archaeological sites is still controversial with some estimates as high as 600,000 artifacts between 2003 and 2007. However, the concerted efforts of those who want to protect Mesopotamia's cultural heritage and history have not been in vain. While not everything has been fully recovered, tens of thousands of artifacts have been returned to the museum. The looting and destruction of many archaeological sites in Iraq have left a dark mark on the history of archaeology. It is a sad fact that, in times of war, buildings that contain irreplaceable historical and cultural sites can also be subjected to its horrors and be destroyed without the possibility of reconstruction. Destroyed by war and conflict, the Library of Alexandria is one such building. Today, it remains forever lost in time. The Ashurbanipal Library suffered much the same fate, but fortunately, the fire that tried to destroy it has ironically preserved it for millennia to come. The Museum of Iraq is also one of these treasure troves, nearly sinking into ruin. Although it suffered losses and destruction over the previous decade, it officially reopened on February 28, 2015. It contains priceless artifacts that date back thousands of years, beginning at the dawn of civilization when mankind built its first cities in the fertile lands of Mesopotamia. Deepen your journey by watching our playlists. And if you want more, just play the next episode that comes up as a suggestion on your left.